When the German writer Goethe visited Ancona, he said it was a place where he could watch the most beautiful sunsets in the world. Strangely enough, he was talking about sunsets at sea, something that is highly improbable in Ancona, which is situated halfway down Italy's Adriatic coast, where the sun sets to the west, the landward side. But the first surprise about Ancona is its geography, a peninsula in the shape of an elbow, which in practice enables you to watch the sun rising and setting over the sea from the same place. In fact, the original name of the city, Ancon, derives from the Greek word meaning elbow. The old part of the city overlooks a large bustling port, while the more modern part, dating from the 18th century, spreads over the eastern side with long avenues running down to the sea. From here, there is a wonderful view over the sea, as can be seen in the part known as the Passetto, where a long flight of steps leads down from the war memorial to a beach that is used by bathers most of the year round. The city has many interesting and evocative sites. In particular, two fountains are worth a visit. The Fontana dei Cavalli, horse fountain, which dates from 1758 and was designed by Lorenzo D'Aretti with fine sculptures by Gioacchino Varley. and the Fontana del Calamo, also known as the fountain with 13 canelli spouts, because of the 13 bronze fawn heads from which the water emerges. It was built around 1560 to the design of Pellegrino Tebaldi in a vigorously mannerist style. One of the focal points of the city is Piazza del Plebiscito, flanked by a handsome building, the Palazzo del Governo, standing beside an older medieval tower dating from the 14th century but rebuilt in 1581. The large clock on the building dates from 1611, the period when the imposing balcony was added. One of the best vantage points overlooking Ancona is the old lighthouse which is at present undergoing major work of restructuring, like so many other sites in the city. From here, there is an excellent view of the two seas for which the city is famous. But to really appreciate the atmosphere of Ancona, you need to wander around the harbour, which is the true heart of the city, not only in terms of trade and tourism, but also in terms of architecture and history. The original harbour dates from ancient Roman times, when the Emperor Trajan landed here, on his way back to Rome after a successful campaign in Dacia. The Emperor commissioned the greatest architect of the period, Apollodorus of Damascus, to construct a harbour here. The people of Ancona were so grateful for this decision that they put up a splendid triumphal arch in his honour. Today, the port of Ancona is the focal point of tourist traffic for the whole of the central Adriatic region, handling millions of passengers every year. But it is also the site of important dockyards and commercial activities due to its geographical location. In fact, over the centuries, the history of Ancona has been determined by a series of invasions and by foreign domination. The climax of Ancona's confused and tormented history was the devastating bombardments during World War II, which practically reduced the city to rubble. However, soon after the war, the city and its harbour were rebuilt and its traditional identity as one of the most important areas on the Adriatic coast was re-established. Many of Ancona's chief monuments are located within the harbour area, 
starting from the immense Lazzaretto, a massive pentagonal building designed, like so many of the city's buildings, by Luigi Van Vitelli, the architect who built the incredible royal palace, the Reggia di Caserta, near Naples. The Lazzaretto, which is located at the innermost part of the port, was begun in 1733. It is completely surrounded by water, since it was intended to be a clinic and quarantine hospital. However, over the years, it took on an increasingly commercial purpose. In the main courtyard stands a small temple dedicated to San Rocco. The buildings facing onto the courtyard used to be dilapidated warehouses, but today they have been restored to their original splendor and have become a fascinating urban area where international exhibitions and art shows are held. Alongside the Lazzaretto, there is another arch reminding us of the city's history. Known as Porta Pia, it was designed and built in the late 18th century by Filippo Marchionni as an impressive and elaborate entrance to the city. It is in the late Baroque style and was dedicated to Pope Pius VI. On the other side of the harbour, there are two more arches which bring to mind great figures from the past, Trajan's Arch and another arch, known as the Clementine Arch, dedicated to Pope Clement XII and designed by the same architect Luigi Van Vitelli who planned so much of the city's development. Another building overlooking the harbour is the Loggia dei Mercanti, Merchant's Loggia the city's most imposing civil monument, which testifies to its ancient trading history. It was originally commissioned in 1392 by the Council of Elders as a site for displaying and trading the goods which arrived in the city in large quantities from overseas. Then, in the mid-15th century, a new facade was commissioned from the architect Giorgio de Sebenico, who apparently received a large fee for his work. His design did not have a religious theme, rather it was based on the virtues of the good Christian merchant, hope, fortitude, justice and charity. Another of the city's important monuments is the impressive Palazzo degli Anziani, Elder's Palace the traditional seat of the civil magistracy, whose origins border on the legendary. It is said that the building dates back to the time of Galla Placidia, the daughter of the Emperor Theodosius. In the 5th century AD, she reigned over the Eastern Empire as regent for her young son, who would later become the Emperor Valentinian III. The original building was razed to the ground by the Saracens and subsequently rebuilt in 1270 in the Romanesque Gothic style. Not far away is Palazzo Ferretti, a fine example of 16th century architecture which today houses one of the most important museums in Italy, the National Archaeological Museum of the Marches region. On the palace terrace, there are copies of a remarkable group of Roman bronzes, the bronzes of Cartocetto, which came to light in 1946 and which date back to imperial times. Reopened in 1988, after a long period of restoration, the museum now has a vast collection of items from all over the Marches region. These remains help visitors to understand the history of the region from prehistorical times to the late Middle Ages. The display includes a wonderful collection of objects in gold, silver and ivory from the East, another witness to the city's commercial tradition.
There is also a display of bronze vessels and shields, as well as elaborately decorated Greek vases and Etruscan bronze items. While the many objects found in tombs dating from the first and second Iron Age show what the earliest Italic civilization must have been like. Ancona also has an excellent municipal art gallery, or Pinacoteca, containing works of considerable value, including two marvellous paintings by Titian, both recently restored, one belonging to the early period of his career, the other from his mature period, a fact which enables visitors to appreciate the development of his artistic style. The deposition of Christ's body, the later work, is a somberly impressive example of his mature style. There are also two interesting works by Guercino. The first is the Immaculate Conception, dating from 1656, with its splendid figures illuminated by a play of light and shadow which enhances the ideal landscape in the background. The second is Santa Palazia, which belongs to the period in which Guercino was using the classical style. In spite of its over-symmetrical layout and the rather conventional figures, the work is still lively and evocative, and the perspective of the architecture contrasts well with the delicate natural background. One of the most precious works in the art gallery is a stupendous miniature by Carlo Crivelli, showing the Virgin and Child. This small painting is a gem of composition and workmanship. The two figures are set against a beautiful landscape full of symbolic elements and the perfect representation in miniature combined with the harmony of the whole makes this 15th century masterpiece an object of rare beauty. The other work by Titian, his celebrated Virgin and Child, is the first work signed and dated by the artist from his earliest period. The painting has recently undergone major restoration work and will soon return to its original site, the main altar of the church of San Domenico in Piazza Plebiscito. In front of this church stands an imposing statue of Pope Clement XII, 
by the sculptor Agostino Cornacchini. Other interesting churches in Ancona include Santa Maria della Piazza, built in the year 1200 on the remains of two early Christian churches dating from the 5th and 6th centuries AD. The unusual Romanesque facade is one of the most interesting in the region. It is made up of a series of horizontal elements known as blind arcading and a fine portal decorated with numerous relief carvings. The church of San Francesco alle Scale has an imposing setting at the top of a steep flight of steps. Renovated in the 18th century, it has a massive portal in the Venetian Gothic style, decorated with statues and bas reliefs by Giorgio Orsini da Sebenico, dating from 1454. We now move on to the highest point in the city from where there is a marvellous view over the harbour, the city and one of the main monuments in the Italian Romanesque style, the cathedral dedicated to St. Syriac. Erected between the 11th and 13th centuries on the foundations of an ancient temple dedicated to Eoplea Venus, dating from the 4th century BC, the cathedral is in the Romanesque style with strong Byzantine influence and some Gothic elements. This combination of styles makes it a landmark in Adriatic architecture, influenced by the East. Built in the shape of a Greek cross and with a 13th century dome, the cathedral has a handsome Gothic portal with bas-reliefs, also dating from the 13th century. The portal is framed by a fine porch supported by columns standing on bases carved in the form of crouching lions. The bell tower stands slightly apart from the cathedral and is built on the foundations of a late 13th century fortified town. Amongst the many works of art in the cathedral, there is the Chapel of the Virgin, whose image is much revered by the people of Ancona. The chapel was sumptuously decorated by Luigi Van Vitelli in 1739. In front of the impressive main altar, dating from the 18th century, are fine wooden choir stalls from the same period. Above the entrance to the sacristy, there is a painting dating from 1520 and attributed to Luca Anconitano, depicting the Virgin with Child and Saints Primian and Syriac. Beneath the floor, some of the columns of the ancient Roman temple can still be seen, witness to the age of the cathedral. In the crypt, there are some urns containing the mortal remains of several saints, including Saint Syriac, the city's patron saint.
Now let's move back to modern Ancona. As evening approaches, other fascinating aspects of the city's lifestyle begin to emerge. The old city comes alive with restaurants, bars and many other places of entertainment. Local people and visitors alike begin to throng the streets and piazzas, ready to enjoy an evening out. Ancona is well known for its local cuisine, and of course one of the specialities is fish, considered to be among the best in the Mediterranean. Then of course there are the fine local wines, one of which, the legendary Rosso Conero, has recently been chosen as one of the top wines in the world. It's worth remembering that the countryside around Ancona also has a lot to offer visitors. Only a short distance away, there are some of the best preserved and most beautiful areas in Italy. Mount Cornaro, for example, is well worth a visit at any time of year, while seaside resorts such as the famous Porto Novo enjoy the distinction of being on the list of recommended beaches. Porto Novo has in fact been awarded the coveted blue flag reserved for the cleanest seawater and beaches in Italy. Right close to Porto Novo, we come to the end of our tour in the shade of a little church, Santa Maria di Porto Novo, which has recently been restored to its ancient splendor. Once part of a Benedictine abbey, this little church dates back to the early 11th century and is a wonderful testimony of faith and beauty in an area which never ceases to amaze visitors. <laughs> 